Hi, fourth grade. I hope you guys are doing incredible. I hope you guys have your routine going and you're looking forward to something special every single day, right? So I kind of advise you guys to kind of set up something to look forward to. I'm doing like Friday night brownies. You guys can do something like that or Taco Tuesdays. Make sure that uh, you have something at least uh, once a week that you guys are looking forward to doing, okay? And keep up your routine. I miss you very much, but I know you guys are going to be incredibly uh, well and that you guys are safe and then you guys are healthy. Um, so we're going to go ahead and read chapter 10 today, uh, which is a very exciting chapter. And then I'll talk a lot about, um, about the challenge for this week. It'll be pretty cool. So... I'm looking forward to seeing your challenges and whatever you guys send me. So remember to keep up with your book and follow along. Here we go, chapter 10. Here we go. All right, so chapter 10 is called The Perfect Day. He heard his dad start his pickup truck. Vroom, vroom. Even though there was no job to go to, he left every morning, early, to look. Sometimes he just hung around all day at the unemployment office. On unlucky days, he got picked up for like to unload a furniture or to do some kind of cleaning. Jess was awake. He might as well get up. He could, he could milk and feed Miss Bessie and get that over with. And he pulled on the t-shirt and overalls over the underwear he slept in. Where are you going? Go back to sleep, Maybell. I can't. The rain makes a lot of noise. Well, we'll then get up then. Why are you so mean to me? Will you shut up, Maybell? You'll have everyone in the whole house woke up with that big mouth of yours. Joyce Ann would have screamed, but Mabel, she just made a face. Right? So maybe you guys can relate a little bit if you guys have siblings, right? Sometimes you love your siblings to death, but you also kind of like want to choke them, right? Uh, so it's kind of like the same feeling here. And also remember that uh, Jesse's dad lost his job. So right now he's just trying to find anything to make ends meet, okay? Let's continue on. Aw, oh, come on, he said. I'm just going to milk Miss Bessie. Then maybe we can watch cartoons if we keep the sound real low. Mabel was as scrawny as Brenda was fat. She stood a moment in the middle of the floor in her underwear, her skin white and goosebumpy. Her eyes were still drooped from her sleep and her pale brown hair stuck up all over her head like a squirrel, like a squirrel's nest on a winter branch. That's got to be the world's ugliest kid, he thought, looking over with genuine affection. He threw her jeans into his face. I'm gonna tell mama. He threw his jeans back at her. Tell mama what? How you just stand there staring at me when I got no clothes on? Lord, she thought he was enjoying it. Yeah, well, he said, heading for the door so he wouldn't throw anything else at him. Pretty girl like you can hardly help myself. He could hear her giggling <laughs> as he crossed the kitchen. The shed was filled with Miss Bessie's familiar smell. He clucked her her gently over and he sat a stool on her flank and the pail beneath her speckled udder. The rain pounded and the metal roof of the shed so that the plank of the milk in the pail set up a counter rhythm. Clunk, 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 clunk. Oh, if it only would just stop raining. He pressed his forehead against Miss, warm, Miss Bessie's warm hide. <sighs> Right? So remember, it's been raining for days on, right? It's been raining for so long that even Jesse's afraid to go to Terabithia, right? And he's just wishing for the day to get better. So he wondered idly if cows were ever scared. Hmm, were cows ever really scared? He had 
passing Miss Bessie Jittle away from P.T. But that was different. A yapping puppy at your heels is an immediate threat, you know? Ah, ah, ah. But the difference between him and Miss Bessie was that when there was no P.T. in sight, she was perfectly content. Sleepily chewing her cud. She wasn't staring down at the old Perkins place wondering and worrying. She wasn't standing there on her tippy toes while anxiety ate holes through all of their stomachs. So um, just so you remember what anxiety is, guys. Anxiety is that feeling where you're worried about the future, something that's going to happen, right? So if you notice that maybe your bunny is sick or, um, you know, you might worry, what if your bunny dies, right? So that, that is an example of anxiety when you're thinking too much of what could happen and you're worried about something. He stroked his forehead across her flank and sighed. <sighs> there was only still water in the creek come summer, he'd asked Leslie to teach him how to swim. How's that, he said to himself. Hmm. I'll just grab the old terror by the shoulders and shake the daylights out of it. Maybe I'll even learn how to scuba dive. He shuddered. He may not have been born with guts, but he didn't have to die without them. He maybe you could just go down to the medical college and get a gut transplant. Hmm? How about it? He smiled. He'd have to tell Leslie about wanting a gut transplant. Mm -hmm. It was the kind of nonsense she appreciated. Of course, he broke the rhythm of the milky long enough to shove his hair out of his face. Of course, what I really need is a brain transplant. Leslie, I know she's not going to bite my head off or make fun of me if I don't want to go across again till the creek's down. All I got to do is say, Leslie, I don't want to go there today. Just like that, easy as pie, right? So maybe some of you guys have had conversations like uh, Jesse, right? Sometimes don't you ever just kind of talk to yourself in your head and you worry, oh my goodness, you do something and you're like, well, that was silly. Well, that was not the best move or, oh my goodness, I shouldn't have pushed him or, you know, that, that kind of situation that you kind of play that in your mind. So he's really feeling and talking to himself that he is not very brave. He has no guts, and that's what having no guts means. It's an expression, right? It's a figurative language. And it really means that you're just kind of like not brave to do something, right? You're scared of doing something. So he's thinking, maybe I should have a brain transplant or a gut transplant, just so he's a little braver. Even though he knows that Leslie's not going to make a big deal out of it. Leslie, I don't want to go over there today. How come? How come? Because, well, well, because. <laughs> I called y'all three times. Mavo was in, imitating Ellie's prissiest manner. You called me for what? Some lady wants you on the telephone. I had to get dressed to come get you. He never got phone calls. Leslie had called him exactly once. And Brenda had gone into such a song and danced with, that, with her about just getting a call from a sweetheart that Leslie had decided it was just simpler to just come over to the house and get him when he wanted to talk. It sounded kind of like Miss Edmonds. It was Miss Edmonds. Death? Her voice flowed through the receiver. <sighs> Miserable weather, isn't it? Uh, 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 yeah, yes, ma'am. He was scared to say more for fear she'd hear him, hear him shake. I was thinking of driving down to Washington, maybe go to the Smithsonian or the National Gallery. How would you like to keep me company? He just broke out in cold sweat. <gasps> Jess? Hello? He licked his lips and shoved his hair off his face. <gasps> Jess? Jess, you still there? Uh, yes, ma'am. He tried to get a deep breath so he could keep talking. 
So, would you like to go with me? Lord. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Well, do you need to get permission? She asked gently. Ah, uh, yeah, y y yes, ma'am. He had somehow managed to twist himself up from the phone cord. Uh, y yes, ma'am. Just, just, just one more minute. He untangled himself, put the phone down quietly, and tippy-toed into his parents' bedroom. His mother back made a long hump under the cotton blanket. He shook her shoulder very gently. Mama? Mama? He was almost whispering. Mama? He wanted to ask her without really waking her up. She was likely to say no if she woke up and actually thought about it. She jumped at the sound, but relaxed again. Ah, ah, not fully awake. Teacher wants me to go to Washington to the Miss, Mrs. Modi, to the Smithsonian. Washington? The syllables blurred. Yeah, something for school. He stroked her upper arm. Be back before it's too late, okay? Um. Don't worry, I'm done milking. Ah, she pulled the blanket to her ears and turned on her stomach. Right? So maybe some of you guys have done the same, right? You know exactly when to talk to your parents, right? Just to get something that you might need, right? You don't really want your mom to be fully awake to realize, right? That you want to go out or something like that or play with your friends. So that's exactly what's happening to him. He's super excited. Because Miss Edmonds is not only his music teacher, remember, but he's what? That's right. That is his long lust crush, right? He loves Miss Edmonds. So could you imagine the person that you have a crush on, right, would automatically invite you somewhere, right? So it's very exciting. And he really doesn't want his mom to say no. So let's continue to see what happens. Jess crept back to the phone. Uh, it's okay, Miss Edmonds. I can go. Great. I'll pick you up in 20 minutes. Just tell me how to get to your house. As soon as he saw her, car turning in, Jess raced out to the kitchen door, through the rain, and met her halfway up the drive. His mother could find out the details from Mabel after he was safely up the road. He was glad Mabel was absorbed in the TV. Uh-huh. He didn't want her waking up Mama before he got away. He was scared to look back, even if he was already in the car and on the main ro road, just for fear that he'd see his mother screaming after him. It didn't occur to him, the car was past Millsburg, that he might have asked Miss Edmonds if Leslie could have come too. When he thought about it, he couldn't suppress the secret pleasure of being alone. You know, in this small, cozy car with Miss Edmonds. So for a split second, he does think about inviting his best friend, Leslie. But for another split second, he realizes, hey, like, hmm, I kind of like this. Just kind of like going on a date, right? Why invite uh, my friend, right? So he decides kind of not, not to say anything. She drove intently, both hands gripping the wheel, peering forward, and the wheels hummed, and the windshield wipers streaked, in a merry rhythm. The car was warm and filled with the smell of <sighs> Miss Edmonds. Jess sat with his hands clasped between his knees and the seat belt tightly across his chest. Damn rain, she said. I'm going stir crazy. Uh, yes, ma'am, he said happily. You too, huh? She gave him a quick smile. He felt dizzy just from the closeness. He nodded. Have you ever been to the National Gallery? Uh, no, ma'am. He had never even been to Washington before, but he hoped she wouldn't ask him that. She smiled at him again. Is this your first trip to an art gallery? Yes, ma'am. 
Great, she said. My life has been worthwhile after all. He didn't understand her, but he didn't care. He knew she was just happy to be with him, and that was enough to know. Even in the rain, he could make out all the landmarks, la looking surprisingly the way the books had pictured them. There was the Lee Mansion high up in the hill, there was a bridge, and there was twice around a circle, so he could get a good look at Abraham Lincoln looking across the city. And then there was the White House and the monument, and at the other end, the Capitol. Leslie had seen all of these places a million times. So could you imagine? He probably lives nearby the Capitol. He lives probably close to Washington, enough for the teacher to drive him. But could you imagine not being outside of your hometown and looking at the actual Capitol, right? So you get to see the White House and all those places. Must be pretty exciting. She had even gone to school with a girl whose father was congressman. He thought he might tell Miss Edmonds later that Leslie was a personal friend of a real congressman. Miss Edmonds had always liked Leslie. Entering the gallery was like stepping inside the pine grove. It was a huge vaulted marble, the cool splash of a fountain, and the green growing all around. There was two little children had pulled away from their mothers and were running about, ah! screaming to each other. It was all Jazz could do to not grab them and tell them how to behave, so obviously like in a sacred place, right? So could you imagine, he's so amazed with this place that even like little kids running around were annoying to him. He wanted to like discipline them. And then the pictures, room after room, floor after floor, he was drunk with colors and form and the hugeness and with the voice and the perfume of, oh, Miss Edmonds, always beside him. She could bend her head down close to his face to give some explanation or ask him a question and her black hair just falling across his shoulders. Men would stare at her instead of the pictures. And Jess felt that they must be jealous of him for being with her. They ate a late lunch in the cafeteria. When she mentioned lunch, he realized with horror that he would need money. <gasps> he didn't know how to tell her that he, did, he hadn't brought any, didn't have any to bring for that matter, but before he even had the time to figure it out, she said, now, I'm not gonna have going into any argument about who's paying. I'm a liberated woman, Jess Aarons. When I invite a man out, I pay. He tried to think of some better way to protest without ending up with a bill, but couldn't, and found himself getting a $3 meal, which was far more than he had meant to have spent on him. Tomorrow he would check out with Leslie how he should have handled things, right? So he is having the time of his life, right? He got to see an amazing art place, because remember he loves art. He is with his love, right? His teacher, he loves his teacher, and he's really excited about it. And he even got lunch for free, right? So after lunch, they trotted along through the drizzle to the Smithsonian to see the dinosaurs and to see the Indians. There they came upon a display case holding a miniature scene of little Indians, and they were disguised in buffalo skins, scaring a herd of buffalo into a stampeding over a cliff to their death with more Indians waiting below to butcher and to skin them. It was a three-dimensional nightmare version of some of his own drawings. He felt a frightening sense of kingship with them. What do you think kingship means? If he looks at that picture and it kind of reminds him of his own art, what do you think kinship means? Something that is like you, right? Something that is like you or related to you. Fascinating, isn't it? Miss Edmund said, her hair brushed up in his cheek as she leaned over to look at it. He touched his cheek. Yes, ma'am. To himself, he said, 
I don't think I like it, but he could hardly pull himself away. When they came out of the building, he was into brilliant spring sunshine. Whoa! Jess blinked his eyes against the glare and the glisten. Whoa! Wow, Miss Edmund said. It's a miracle, behold! There's sun! I was beginning to think she had gone into a cave and vowed never to return, like that Japanese myth. He felt good again. All the way home, in the sunshine, Miss Edmonds told funny stories about going to college and one year in Japan, where all the boys had been shorter than she, and she hadn't known how to use the toilets. He relaxed. <sighs> he had so much to tell Leslie and ask her. It didn't matter how angry his mother was going to be. She'd get over it. And it was worth it. This was one perfect day of his life. It was worth anything he had to pay. One dip in the road before the old Perkins place, he said. Just let me out in the road, Miss Edmonds. Don't try to turn in. You might get stuck in the mud. <laughs> okay, Jess, she said. She pulled over this road. And thank you for a beautiful day. The western sun dance on the windshield dazzling his eyes. He turned and looked at Miss Edmonds, full in the face. No, ma'am. His voice sounded squeaky and strange, and so he cleared his throat. <clears throat> no, ma'am. Thank you. Well, he hated to leave without being able to really thank her, but the words were not coming in from him for now. Later, of course, they would when he was lying in bed or sitting in the castle. Well, he opened the door and got out. See you next Friday. She nodded, smiling. See you soon. And so he watched the car out of sight and then turned and ran all his might to the house. The joy jiggling inside of him so hard they wouldn't have been surprised if his feet had just taken off from the ground the way they sometimes did in dreams and they just floated him right over the roof. He was all the way into the kitchen before he realized that something was wrong. His dad pickup had been outside the door, but he hadn't taken it until he came into the room and found them all sitting there. His parents and the little girls all on the kitchen table and Ellie and Brenda not watching TV. There was no food on the table, no eating. It wasn't even turned on. He stood unmoving for a second while they stared at him. Suddenly, his mother let out a great shabbering sob. Oh my God, oh my God, oh, oh my God. He said it over and over, her head down in her arms. His father moved to put his arms around her awkwardly, but he didn't take off his look off Jess. I told you, you just gone off somewhere, Maybell said quietly and stubborn, stubbornly, as though he had repeated it often and no one had believed her. He squinted his eyes and the Zoe trying to peer down at a dark drain pipe. He didn't even want to know what question to ask them. What? What? He tried to begin. Brenda's pounding voice broke in. Your girlfriend's dead. Mama thought you were dead too. Okay, so um, so we left in a very exciting part in this book, right? What does that mean? He comes home and everybody's just waiting for him and very worried about him. And Mabel's like, I told you, he just went somewhere. So obviously his parents were very, very worried, right? So wondering what is happening and why his sister would say such a thing. So for this, uh, I'm excited to read the next chapter. Uh, this chapter, guys, um, was titled The Perfect Day. So for this week's challenge, what we're gonna do is that I want you to visualize your perfect day. Imagine I have a magic wand, right? Bippity boppity boo, right? When I did that, you had the perfect day. How would that look like, right? Remember that when you guys are writing, so it's gonna be a writing challenge, you wanna tell me how that would look like how would that smell like? How would that sound like? So be as descriptive as possible. What would your perfect day entail, right? 
my perfect day would be a day full of sunshine and fresh air and i would hear birds chirping i could be able to see birds that are blue orange mix of colors right so go into that and how your perfect day would be and you could either one write it or two draw it but again I want you to take pride in your work. So make sure you color it, make sure you put a lot of detail on your writing or in your picture, lots of detail as well, and get ready to share for our next virtual meeting, okay? And that way we can see your beautiful artwork or your beautiful letter that you might write or your essay or whatever it is. Um, so what would your perfect day look like? So you could just write it, you can do it in a poem form, or you can do it in a picture form, whichever you choose. But what is your envision of the perfect day? Just like Jesse had with his girlfriend or whatnot, right? His extra loving crush that he has. How would your perfect day look like? All right, guys, much love to you. I hope you guys are doing well. I miss you lots and have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye.